good morning, everybody. Hey, my name is Nate. I am one of the pastors on staff here at Peak City Church. Can we welcome everybody that's watching at Church Online this morning? Glad to have you with us. Hey, you walked in at the kickoff of a brand new message series called Faith in Real Life, Faith IRL. And what we're talking about are the practical ways that we put our faith into action. Faith isn't some ambiguous thing like, I, I've got it, but I don't know what to do with it. It's not some mystical whatever kind of, it's, this is something that God has placed in our hearts and he has given us some very practical ways to walk that out and put it on display for other people to see. Your faith should be visible. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on now. Hey, this is going to be a lot easier today if you amen the preacher. All right. I might even preach a little faster. God works miracles. Amen. Amen. So look, I mean, we're glad you're here. Also, if you're a first time guest, don't forget what Christina said before you leave today. We've got a gift to give you at the table uh, out back at the guest services table. And I also want to say this, we're going to receive an offering at the end of our worship celebration. If it's your first time here, please do not feel obligated to give in that offering. Your presence here is a gift to us, which tees up what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so <laughs> I preach this twice a year, and uh, somebody just said, oh boy, you didn't hear that on the camera. <laughs> I preach this twice a year. So you walked in on the day where we're talking about biblical generosity. So this isn't something we preach every week when you show up at Peak City Church, but it's a principle that's so important and it changes us so much that we preach this two times a year. And I never tell our church family when I'm going to preach it because you probably might not come to church that day. Like you might say, well, you know what? I feel like the Lord's leading me to go to Topsail Island for, for, for worship on Sunday, but we're glad that you were here. Uh, so I'm going to be in the Word of God in the book of 2 Corinthians. I'm going to be reading verses, uh, ch chapter 9, verses 7 through 11. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 11. I'll be reading from the ESV today when we get there. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. I'm going to pray, and we're going to jump in. Father, I pray that you would speak your truth to us today. May that be the thing that changes us. God, I pray that you would transform our hearts today. There's some people that have walked in the room very burdened. And today, I know you have a word that can set a lot of people free. And so I pray that we would receive your truth, that your word would change us. I pray that anything that I say that doesn't come from you would just fall on deaf ears. And so we ask for that today. We need your help today. Holy Spirit, be here. Guide us as we worship you in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 So listen, when it comes to living out your faith so people can see it, one of the most practical ways that you could ever do it is through your generosity. Christians should be marked with that. Like Your neighbor should know that if they're in trouble, you're going to help them. Because you are a follower of Jesus. That you are going to give them your time. That you are going to use your talents to help them. And if need be, you're going to use your treasure to bless them. You should be, we should be known for generosity. In fact, it's not just an individual thing, but it's a collective we thing as well. That's why this is one of our core values as a church. Our core value is we give generously. And the reason is you can't outgive God. Try. I've been trying for years. I've been, I've been walking with Christ since I was a little boy. My parents taught me this principle, so what I'm teaching you today comes very easily for me, and I totally understand not so much for others, okay? Now, I've witnessed God's provision and his blessings through the leanest times in my life, but I've tried my very best to always put him first. So you need to hear this. Before we get into the word today, everything we're teaching today, my wife and I are living. When I talk about the tithe, my wife and I, we return 10% of our income before it's taxed, before benefits are taken out, before it's touched by anything, to the Lord, because that is holy. It belongs to him. We don't even consider ourselves generous for returning that 10% to the Lord because it's not ours. How can I be generous with something that does not belong to me? And then beyond that, we give and give joyfully. I'm going to circle back to this in the message but I've been married to that beautiful Italian girl, and she's a spicy Italian, too. How many of you know some of those Italian ladies? Wow, you better watch out. They are firecrackers, all right? One thing that she and I have never fought about in 18 years of marriage is money and our finances. Why? Let's listen to the message, and we're going to learn more about that. 
We live generously as a church. I want Peak City Church to be known for its generosity. In our community, it's starting to catch on. We're, six, we're, you know, we're almost six years old. And now we've got schools in town, high schools, elementary schools, middle schools. They know if there's a need, they can call Peak City Church at Christmas time. We stock the entire clothing closet for Christmas for all the students at Salem Middle School. And for the four years previously, we sponsored 45 or so students every single Christmas with Christmas gifts that we gave to their parents, unlabeled, wrapped, and ready to go, where their mothers and fathers could hand them the gifts and say, hey, Merry Christmas for children that otherwise would have had nothing. We send hundreds of gifts all around the world through Operation Christmas Child. Hey, we're, we're giving our time. We're cleaning up the streets. on our, our, our town is beautiful. It stays very clean as it is. But we go out there and prayer walk and pick up trash and do whatever we can do to be a blessing with our time. We give our talents. We serve others. And it's starting to catch on because we should be known for our generosity. We should be known for our willingness to give of our time to go and serve somebody. We should be known to be able to bless somebody financially when there's a need. And that's who God's calling his church to be and all of us individually as we scatter. We should be marked by generosity if we're followers of Jesus. But let's get into the problem with this. Most Americans don't feel rich. But we are. Can I say that again? If you live in this country, you are blessed in ways that you cannot even imagine if you've never seen life in another place outside of the United States. If you don't think what I'm saying is true, okay, well, let me, let me ask you a simple question. Crowd participation, and we'll all probably be raising our hands, so let's just go ahead and loosen up the shoulder, okay? How many of you in the past month ate food in a restaurant where someone cooked that food for you and you paid money for it? Everybody, adults, kids, all right, put your hand down. Question, we're not rich, by the way, right? We're not rich. Um, question, did you ride in a car that was either owned by you or someone in your family to go to that restaurant? If that's you, raise your hand. All right, that's a lot of us, but we're not rich, right? But we're not rich. The hand down. Now, when you left that restaurant and returned... Did you return back to either an apartment or a house in which you live? Do you have a place that you live that you return to in your car? If you did, raise your hand. But yet, but yet America, but, but we're not rich, right? No, no, no. For some of you, maybe not for everybody, but if you're like me, when you got back to your house, I was able to push a button <laughs> up on my visor, and this door on my home opened. And there was a house for my car to be able to pull into. Yet, we're not rich. Come on. Hey, oh, how, let's take it a step further. Maybe you don't have one of those little doodads. That's cool. Did you, after two and a half, three hours of eating that delicious meal, I don't care if it was Chick-fil-A or if it was something fancy on Salem Street, right? Whatever that was. When things started bubbling around, was there a room in your apartment or your house that you were able to go to and relieve yourself? If there was, wave at me, huh? And then you magically pushed down a lever or a button and whatever you put in that bowl went away. Praise God for that, right? Yet, yet, we say we are not rich. You have no idea how blessed we are. To just to even be living where we are right now. And there are people from all over the world sitting in these seats right now, and they know. Because with the places they come from, they see poverty in such a stark way. And we cannot take this for granted. And listen, if you are a follower of Christ, you need to realize that you are blessed to be a blessing. The problem is this. Did you know that if you own a home that's worth about $150,000 or more, that probably puts you in the wealthiest 10% of all of the people in the world. But we're not rich. Let's think about this, church. Now, here's the problem. Most Americans think that we are generous, but we aren't. 
Most Americans think, you know, I'm a generous person because I think all of us in the room, we want to be givers. I think we all do. I think that we all know it's blessed to, more blessed to give than to receive. And we want to be givers, but a lot of us have this mindset that says, you know, I'm, I'm a very generous person. Well, the average American only gives 2.8% of their income. And some people say, well, hang on now, wait, 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 wait. You know, if I had more, I would give more. Well, statistics say that's not even true. In the United States, the people that make $100,000 or to $250,000, that percentage then goes down from 2.8% to giving 2.6%. People get more and they give less. You see, that is so upside down when it comes to God's economy. The gospel flies in the face of that kind of thinking, that kind of mentality, because we are supposed to be marked by our generosity. But here's what I think. Here's what I think, and you can help me if I'm wrong. I think most people want to give more, but most people don't think that they can. Most people have this mindset that just says, I can't do it. And the reason that we don't, I believe you can call it a scarcity mindset. Like, think about this. We live in a nation where people get paid... And in the United States, on average, people spend 117% of what they make. Now, I'm no math expert. But last time I checked, that's more than you have, right? And so this is, this is what that does. And remember, receive all this today is something I desperately want for you, okay? This message is not about separating you from your money to get it in the coffers here at Peak City Church. It is not about that, okay? And if you think I'm being disingenuous, I'm going to circle back to this towards the end of the message to prove to you that I'm not. I'm just saying this is something I want so badly for you, all right? So now here's the issue, though. We run into this mindset that says, I want to be a giver. I want to be generous. But when God blesses me, I get caught up in this cycle of scarcity in my mindset. This is what it looks like. So God will supply, and then what do we do immediately? We consume it. We take everything that God gave, and we spend it on, you know, all of our bills that are might maybe even a month back or, you know, whatever. I know, I know that's not you in the room, but you probably know somebody that might have been in that trouble before, right? So for a friend, let them know about this message, or you can take some notes for your friend, right? So we consume it all, we take everything we have and we spend it, and then if there's something left, then, you know, maybe then we'll save it, and then there's something left after that, maybe then we'll, we'll return that to the Lord. But what happens is we consume it all, and then we don't have enough. We lack. And that's when we start saying things like, man, there's just too much month at the end of the money. Just can't make ends meet. Like, it's just, there's weeks left here, I've got bills to pay, and I don't have anything. And then what do you do? You fear. You don't know where the provision is going to come from. You feel like you're never going to get by. You're living paycheck to paycheck every single week. And then God supplies more. And then what do you do? You go right back and you consume it all again. And you stay caught up in this vicious cycle. And friends, if you're expecting a different outcome from that, it's not coming. If this is where you are now and you don't allow the Holy Spirit to change this, this is where you will be 20 years from now. This is where you will be hoping that social security comes around for you when you get to retirement age. This is life. Unless you allow God to change your mindset. When you do it his way, things will be transformed. You've got to break out of this scarcity mindset. Now, for all of us that are here today, you can have a totally different mindset when it comes to generosity because of what Jesus did for us. Okay, now listen, this is what we do to break out of this scarcity mindset. So simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. We give generously. Look, I'm going to get to the scripture here. Let's look at what the Bible says about this. I'm going to break this down. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. Verse 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Time out. Each one should give what they've decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So if you feel like somebody's twisting your arm to try to get you to do something that you're not comfortable with or you don't want to do, obey God's word. Obey God's word. Don't you let somebody manipulate you into doing something because they're saying you have to and you don't want to. Because look at the condition of the heart that God wants you to have when you give. All right? 
I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth. I'm just saying, listen, if you're going to be angry about giving to the Lord, I, I, just, I say this with all the love I know how to say this with. God does not need your money. God does not need your resources. He wants you to be surrendered to him, and he wants to bless you. And he promises that he will. And I'm going to show you how that blessing looks. But it might not be like what you've been taught in the past. I've heard pastors stand up on the stage and talk about how if you give to God, then he's like a slot machine where he's just going to give you more and more and more and make you rich. I have read about the blessings that are poured out all throughout this word, and they are true. But there's nothing in the Bible that says if you give, God will make you rich. That is twisting the... Listen, we don't preach a prosperity gospel at Peak City Church, but we also don't preach an ascetic gospel. We don't preach a poverty gospel. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what God says is true in his word when we, his people, act in generosity, it is true. And he promises what we're about to read here. He says that God loves a cheerful giver. He wants your heart to be joy-filled. In fact, that word cheerful even can be used as the word hilarious in the original language that it was written in. So that kind of joy when you give, God wants that. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Now that's some fancy writing for Paul saying to you that God will provide for everything that you need whenever you need it, every time you need it. And there is no question about that. The Bible says, my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. It doesn't say that he'll give me everything I want, but friend, let me tell you something. I have been faithful in this area of my life and watched God's faithfulness through the decades. When I had next to nothing, God still showed up. And when I put him first, he blessed the rest. I was a youth pastor. I've shared this story many times with you. I had a wife who could not work a job because she was in graduate school. So we had school bills we were paying. We had a house in Apex. We had a townhouse. We had a car payment. I was making a whopping $29,500 a year. But guess what? 2,950 of those went back to Jesus because they belonged to him. And he provided everything that we ever needed over those two years. I did not have one late payment on a bill. We did not go without one meal. Everything was provided for because God is faithful. So some of you today, you hear this and you say, ah, I just... I can't step into this. Friend, you can't afford not to. I want you to receive this today. I'm saying this with a heart of love for you because this is what we do. We give generously, all right? The scripture says God has given us everything we need. Every time we need it, he will provide. And God loves it when we give. It says he loves a hilarious, joy-filled, cheerful giver. And guess who else loves it? People. You want someone to know that you believe in Jesus and you do something kind and generous for them, they might listen to what you have to say. If the church got great at loving people and being generous towards people, instead of showing people how angry we are with them or the things that they've done wrong, you would have a much, much higher leg to stand on with them to be able to speak truth into their life. They might actually want to know the Jesus that has transformed your life and praise God, he might just transform theirs. And this is a tangible way to live out your faith in real life. This is what we do. We do this because this is what God does. Now look, God promises that when we give generously, that he will multiply what we give abundantly. What that means is there will always be enough. In fact, we sing about a God that is more than enough because that's his name, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, the God that is more than enough. And when I pray for God's provision, I pray for that. I ask, Lord, give give me more than I need so that I can be generous towards other people because that is a biblical principle. And I believe that, that God will give you more than you need as long as you can remember who the more is for. Come on, we're getting quiet in this Holy Ghost field church right now. Come on. You've got to remember that when God blesses you with more than you need, then that more has a purpose. Can you enjoy it? Yes, absolutely. And if somebody's told you, you know what, you're supposed to give everything away until you're dirt poor and your family's destitute, that's not in here either. It just says when God says for you to give that you respond with a yes and you understand that when you give, he will provide. He'll multiply what you gave and you will have more than enough. And so when he gives you that more than enough, you use that extra to bless somebody else. You've got to remember who the more is for. So God multiplies abundantly. Let me show you this in scripture. 
Verse 10, it says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, that's God, will supply and multiply your seed. In other words, God's going to multiply what he gives you, but look what he multiplies it for. For sowing, he multiplies, he gives you more than you need so that you can use it to be a blessing to somebody else. So you can sow that seed into the life of somebody else. He says he gives it for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. For you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. That's a much better way to live than closed fisted. Just kind of a couple of y'all in here with your arms folded, staring at me like, hurry it up. There's a better way to live. Friends, I, I'm telling you this. If you lean into this principle, you know what you'll be freed from? That insatiable desire for more. Like, I'm telling you, if you walk this out, all of a sudden the shackles that are holding you down because you can't ever have enough, you just need just a little bit more. It's never enough. That will be broken off of you. You can be freed from that and you can be satisfied with everything that God has blessed you with. And then as you grow into that maturity, I believe that he'll give you more because you're going to use it to bless somebody else. We are stewards of what we have, not possessors. And when we steward what we have and we understand that it all comes from God, we look at it differently and we use those resources differently. When we sow, God supplies. So I want to show this to you now. So we have this scarcity mindset when God supplies on the one side. But then when we actually put God first, everything changes. And listen, it is a clarion call for my family that we put God first in everything. You know why? Because it doesn't matter what you or I think about it. God is always first. That is a great time for somebody to say amen. Amen. He is always first. And in my house, God comes first. He gets our best. And he is our highest priority. So then what that means is when God supplies, we give. Like we return the tithe to God. Like I had mentioned before, 10% of our income before it's tax touched with anything, the, the, the gross total of that amount, we return that to the Lord. We believe that's holy. And then, you know, honestly, I'm just, just to share the truth here, we give more. We return more than 10% of our income to the Lord. And we do it joyfully because for a Christ follower, tithing is the floor. It is not the ceiling. And because God has blessed us so so richly that we continue to return more and more to him. And then if things come up and we want to give to those things, initiatives where the Lord's tugging on our heart, we do that too. And guess what? We don't ever have any knockdown, drag out fights about it because we do it with joy. Money is not a source of contention in our home. Satan cannot use that to drive us apart because God is the one that is in charge of supplying all of our needs. And when we put him first, he blesses the rest. He blesses not only what you have, he blesses your attitude towards what you have. I'm preaching to somebody today. Let's keep going here. God, he supplies. So here's what he does. We give, and then all of a sudden when we give, God multiplies what we have. And he provides enough, and a lot of times more than enough. And then guess what happens? Our faith then grows. Wow, God, you provided in some ways that I never even expected. But when you come first, I'm expecting you to take care of the things that I don't even know or see. And then it brings you back into the cycle. God supplies. And then you give. And then all of a sudden, God multiplies what you have. And there's more than enough. And your faith grows again and again and again. Until this is just an afterthought for you. God comes first. It's not about trying to, oh, I've got to save up for whatever I can get. And Lord, if you can get a cut of that, then great. No, that's not your heart anymore. And friends, and this is how this happens. When you want to break out of the scarcity mindset and you want to move into this mindset of supply, it is tithing that breaks the cycle of scarcity and it creates this new cycle of supply. Now, let me tell you how it works. The word tithe came from the Old Testament. And some of y'all are like, yeah, Nate, that's Old Testament. We're a New Testament church, so we don't have to do that. Okay, well, you're, you're right that it is Old Testament. I mean, it's old Old Testament. Like, throw it back before Moses. Before, the, like, before Motown, there was the tithe. Abraham returned a portion of what he had to the Lord. We saw that example there. But then in the New Testament... So there's there's a pretty important figure in the New Testament. Twice he mentions in the gospel that we should tithe. And it wasn't Peter. 
And it wasn't the Apostle Paul that I'm referring to, even though he clearly tells us to be generous. It wasn't John. It wasn't James. It was Jesus Christ himself. And some of you, something just went off in your head like a broken record. Like, what? Yeah, look, the bottom line for us is the tithe is not some done away with idea. The word comes from the Hebrew word ma'aser, which means tenth. So a tenth of what we have, we return it to the Lord. Now, Jesus taught this principle, and here's how he did it. The Pharisees, who were the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they were, they, you know, they were just trying to get every jot and tittle of what they had. They'd separate 10% of everything. Their coins and money, their crops, right down to the herbs in their herb garden. Herbs, if you're from Scotland or something like that. I don't know. They'd separate all that stuff out, and they would take that to the temple, and they'd give that as a tithe to the Lord. And Jesus said, hey, you're great at doing that, but when it comes to actually standing for justice, showing mercy and compassion to people, you forget all about that. Now, he could have let the Pharisees off the hook there, but he didn't. Let's look at what the Bible says in Matthew 23, 23. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. How many of you know when Jesus says, woe to you, it ain't good, all right? So Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. And these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So right when Jesus could have let the Pharisees off the hook and said, you, you should not worry about tithing and do those things over here. Jesus didn't do that. He said, you ought to tithe and do those things. See, these are the words of our Lord. And it's not just something that God wants us to do to get something from us. That's not the idea. It's showing who we're truly surrendered to because God wants something for us. Let me talk about the power of the tithe. Let me tell you what it does. The first thing that it does is the tithe teaches us to put God first, just like I'd mentioned before. When God comes first, he will bless the rest of everything you have. I love the way the Living Bible says this in Deuteronomy 14. It says the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. The point is that you will put him first before everything else. Now, you've seen me give this illustration before. I could stand on stage with, with 10 $1 bills. And I could use this as an example and say, you know, with these 10 $1 bills, we're going to pay all of our bills this month. And somebody said, I receive it. Praise the Lord, right? $10. Now, let's just pretend like that'll cover everything. But our inclination is to go, okay, you know what? I'm going to take, take two of these dollars, and I've got to use that to pay the, the mortgage, the rent, whatever that is, my insurance bills, uh, a couple of bills here to pay for you know, the, kids, uh, the, the things the kids need to get ready for school. Maybe they're in school, and you've got to pay for that. Uh, you know, you've got to pay for clothes and gas and your bills and a couple bucks for that. And then you got some other expenses coming up because you got some credit card debt that you got to pay on. You pay a bunch to that. And then if you got something left, you might save a little. And then if you still got a dollar left, you say, hey, Lord, hey, it's 10%. This is for you. Is that a tithe? Why? It is not a tithe because you did not give it first. And God always comes first. You see... And it takes faith to give first. When you don't know what's coming that month, when you don't know if the car is going to break down, or you're going to have to replace that, that air conditioner in your house, or whatever might go sideways, or that medical bill comes up, or whatever that looks like, when you don't know what's going to happen, and you return the tithe to God, that takes faith. But it doesn't take faith to give last. Friends, and I want to say this out of a heart of love to you. Not, I'm not condemning, because if you're giving, I praise God for that whenever you're giving. I believe God uses that. But God does not want our leftovers. God wants to be first. He wants us to act in faith, to put him first in all things. He does not want to be the last person we turn to when we need help. When it comes to prayer, that is a first resort, not a last resort. And in the same way, he wants to be Lord over every area of our life, including our finances. So the tithe teaches us to put God first. The, thing, the next thing it teaches us is the tithe, it builds our faith. Malachi chapter 3 says this, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there might be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. 
And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. This is the only time in the Bible where God says, test me. When it comes to your generosity, he says, test me. And see if I will not provide more than enough. And this is the only place anywhere in the scripture where I see this. What God is saying is, hey, if you give me your best and your first, I will bless the rest. When he comes first, he will provide. He absolutely will. And listen, here's how much I I mean this. If you think that what I'm saying is just a bunch of arm twisting from a preacher, you're receiving this the wrong way. I believe in this so much that I would challenge you to say, if you are willing to tithe, do it to another gospel preaching church here in Apex. You know, just down the street here, we've got Apex Baptist, Apex First Baptist right down the road. We've got, you know, I think the Point Church has campuses all over the place. There are all kinds of opportunities for you to, if you want to, if you don't think I'm being sincere, tithe to another church that's preaching the gospel, do it for six months. And after six months, if you feel like you've just lost something, that this is not, you're not seeing God's provision and his blessings, it's not reshaping your heart and how you love people, it's not bringing peace into your home when it comes to finances, if that is not the case, Come back to me in six months and you hand me a record of everything that you tithed into that church and Peak City Church will refund you dollar for dollar. This is not a platitude. This is how much we believe in this principle because it's not something we want from you. It's something we want for you. And until you do it, you will not see the impact. How many of you serve somewhere in the church? Wave at me if you serve, okay? How many of you, before you started serving, you thought, I'm going to do this because I want to help my church? Most all of us, right? But then how many of you, when you started serving, found out it did more for you than it did for the church? But you didn't know until you stepped out in faith and you did it. I can preach all day about this, but I want you to hear from somebody in our church family who said it really, really well. Check out the testimony from our brother, Tim Burns. My name is Tim, and this is how God has provided for me in my life. Yeah, so growing up, I was always a person that was never a believer in tithing. Right? So my wife was always a believer in tithing, was always trying to get me to tithe as a family and she believed in the blessings of God. But I just, I always had that opinion that you hear a lot of people say that, you know, the church doesn't need my money, God doesn't need my money, that, you know, they can take care of it and they're, they're fine. It came a time where I lost a lot of positions throughout a couple years in jobs, right? So I was stable for like 10 years and then it was just job loss after job loss through many years. And after about the third time of us going through that, I was unemployed and I finally came to the point where I told my wife that, you know, it's, it's probably about time that we give God a try and we try this tithing because it's not working my way. We were going to a church in Florida at that time that was giving sermons about tithing and provided a tithing challenge. We went ahead and we started tithing even though we didn't have income at that time and we started giving. We gave our 10% and as we were giving and tithing, we found that opportunities started opening, right? So my heart changed and I started serving in church. It's the first time I've ever started serving in church. A Couple months down the road after serving, another person that serves at the church approached me about a position that was a computer position. I didn't have any type of computer degree. I didn't have any type of job experience, but I grew up with computers and I've self-taught myself a lot in computers. So I decided to go ahead and give the recruiter a call and I ended up getting that position, which started my whole IT career of basically getting into business intelligence. And so opportunities just started coming in and I've gone through probably about three positions where just opportunities came to me that wouldn't normally happen, right? It's just, it wasn't, I saw a position open, I went to it. It was people that were approaching me, and every time the income went up. As God was opening new opportunities, you know, I started realizing that, you know, there was a lot of a lot of greed in my heart at the time that started to break free. Right? It was it wasn't about God so much providing income and providing, you know, money checks coming in, but it was opportunities that he opened in my life to allow that to come in, right? So I started getting a lot more involved in the church. I started getting a lot more involved with people. And, you know, every time I've tried to outgive and tried to provide, it's come back even more as opportunities. So 
God can't give to a closed fist, right? So it turns into, as you give the money, you start realizing that your heart's changing and you can freely give. And that need to hold on to the money starts to disappear. I would say if, you, if you're not tithing, you know, test it, give it, give it a try. You know, so many times that I was hanging on and when you let it go, it's, it's freeing, you know, it just, it takes that burden off of you, that, that greed, that guilt and everything. It just, it's freeing to do. And like I said, you know, God could bless the church with room full of diamonds if he wanted to, but it's a, it's a blessing that he gives us to be able to give, right? Cause it does free us. I just want to leave you with this thought and then we're going to worship together, pray together. And then we're going to go and be a blessing to our community. When you surrender your heart and your life to the Lord in this way, not only will you see his provision in your life, but you will see how he uses you supernaturally to be his provision in someone else's life. I am a living witness. My wife sat in those seats in the last worship celebration when I told this story. So you can fact check her right away, right? You might have heard it before. Uh, One night we were asleep, uh, sleeping soundly, and then all of a sudden my wife sat bolt upright in the bed. It was 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, and she gives me the elbow. She's like, hey, wake up, wake up. I'm like, I am awake, girl. Please stop stabbing me with that stiletto elbow right there. Like, ah. She said, I need need you to write a check to our friends so-and-so and and -and so-and-so. Those friends had just taken a big step of faith three months before to go down to South Carolina to help start a church down there. And, you know, the the wife had a photography business, had landed a good gig down there and was going to be able to get started right away. And he was getting paid what he could get paid by the church uh, that he was starting. And the gig that she had fell through after they had paid their two-month deposit. They had come up on the first month where they actually had to regularly pay their rent. And they were short. And we didn't know any of that at the time when my wife sat bolt up right in bed and said, write, write this check to so-and-so and so-and-so. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. She's like, no, do it now. I was like, all right, girl, what in the world? Got the checkbook, wrote the amount out, and I think it was le- for less than $200. So it wasn't some massive amount of money, but it was something. And she's like, now, hey, put an envelope, get the church database, write their address on it and send it. Put a stamp on it, put it in the mailbox. I was like, now? She said, Now. Do it now. I was like, well, I really want to go back to bed. So, okay. I did it, right? Wrote the check, put it in the envelope, put it in the mailbox, put the flag up, didn't think about it. Three days later, I got a call from my friend sobbing on the other end of the phone. Because what we did not know was that they had fallen short on their rent money that month after everything had been paid. But they put God first. They tithed on what they had. And then when they came short, they cried. They prayed. They said, God, we don't know what to do. And a little bit before he called me on the phone, God said, go out to the mailbox. And they walked out and they found a check that was written for the exact amount to the dollar of where they fell short that month. My God will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. How can you not want to be a part of that? I want to be, and I'm so thankful that I can be, but it takes a step of faith. Can I pray for us? God, I pray for every single person in the room that may struggle with this when it comes to being generous. Lord, I pray that you would free some people that are just bound, kind of locked into the scarcity mindset that just uses everything they can for whatever we want without putting you first. And in our heart, we'd like to be a person that you use to bless somebody, but, but we, we've never surrendered that area of our life to you. So I pray for those people that you would set them free from that. And I pray that people would step out into the joy of being a blessing to somebody. I pray for opportunities for everyone here this week to encounter someone, and that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of our hearts say, saying, I sent you to be that need meter. That we would be a vessel that you would work through. 
to show your provision to someone that needs it. God, let us be that kind of people.